Thank you very much, Simon, and also to BT for this fantastic venue, uh, which does sort of make me feel like I'm at some type of award ceremony or something like that. So, uh, so thank you so much for hosting it, and as you say, for being such a great supporter of reform. Um, We've had an incredible response for this event, uh, despite the fact that we only obviously invited people literally a couple of weeks ago, and it normally takes a lot longer to get people to want to uh, come to events and sort out their diaries, which I like to think is because of the outstanding reputation that Reform has for delivering brilliant events, and I'm sure it is partly that, uh, but I think it might have something to do with the all-star cast uh, that we've managed to bring together, and I'm incredibly grateful uh, to our speakers today. Um, I mean, none of them really need any introduction, but I will just do so anyway. So, uh, the sort of, I suppose, the face of BBC's election night, really, uh, and obviously Professor at uh, Strathclyde University, uh, Sir John Curtis, uh, Ben Page, who you will, I'm sure, be aware is Chief Executive of the polling company Ipsos Mori. So, uh, brilliantly positioned, I think, uh, with both Sir John and Ben to actually understand what's going on uh, in terms of voters' uh, attitudes and constituency level uh, data, I hope. Uh, and then two fantastic commentators in Pippa Crea from uh, The Mirror, political editor at The Mirror, uh, and Madeleine Grant, who's assistant comment editor at The Telegraph. Uh, so I'm really thrilled to have such a brilliant cross-section uh, of speakers uh, this evening. Reform doesn't tend to do things during a general election. Uh, but we felt that this year it felt slightly different. Um, partly, I suppose, because as it's become very fashionable to say, this will be one of the most consequential elections uh, post-war. Partly, I suppose, because of the degree of uh, I guess, voter volatility. Um, so I'm sure that you know, one or more of our panellists will mention that we've seen the highest level in the last decade of people actually switching their votes by party. But principally for us at Reform, as we are a public services think tank, uh, it is because, thankfully, perhaps a silver lining in the general election, I mean, maybe people have lots of different silver linings and are delighted that we have a Christmas election, but the silver lining for us is the fact that it has finally swung the spotlight back onto domestic policy and the things that people really, really care about because they directly impact their lives, be that the NHS or policing uh, or you know, how we do create digital infrastructure and various things like that. Um, so that's why we wanted to host tonight uh, in order to help unpick, I suppose, um, the role of domestic policy uh, in this current general election. I'm sure we'll also talk a bit about Brexit. I'm sure we'll talk about you know, politics more, more purely, but that's really what I would like us to be able to pick, on, uh, pick up on a bit to understand uh, what we think is going to really play in the election in terms of uh, public services and public policy. Um, so thank you all for coming out this evening. Um, it's not the warmest day, you know, and I appreciate it is your evening, and I'm sure everybody is already planning when they need to get back to watch the head-to-head -head, uh, this evening. Uh, but perhaps this will be a good kind of, you know, warm-up, I suppose, to the leaders' uh, debate uh, later today. There is some networking, so you can at least grab a beer or something and then head off uh, afterwards to watch uh, the debate. Um, I'm going to start by asking each of the panellists just to speak very briefly, sort of a few opening remarks to set the context. Um, and then I will just ask, as uh, sort of chair's prerogative, a few kind of questions covering things like, you know, the impact of demographics, kind of, you know, what constituencies and areas we, be sh we should be particularly focusing on. And of course, things like which policies are actually going to cut through and, and how that's going to impact uh, the result. Um, I will ask at the very end uh, what everybody thinks is going to be the outcome. I'm sure everybody will sort of look at me and say, well, of course, we can't predict it for all the reasons you've just said, Charlie. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I will try putting them on the spot. I'm sure you also have loads of questions, so we'll make sure that we leave plenty of time uh, for you to ask as well. Uh, so without further ado, I think we'll just sit and, you know, kind of speak from our chairs. But if I can uh, open with Sir John, if you can give your uh, comments. Thank you, Charlotte. You've put me in the somewhat embarrassing position that I'm about to disagree fundamentally with quite a lot of what okay. you've just said. But anyway, <laughs> um, that at least will start starting off the evening on a relatively <laughs> lively basis because I'm afraid I am going to argue that it is primarily about Brexit. And that indeed, you know, I want to take you back first to the 2017 election. Um, the 2017 election was, of course, um, precipitated by the then Prime Minister Theresa May uh, because she wanted a larger majority, because she foresaw the difficulties that she was going to have in getting a withdrawal treaty. That's not quite how she put it, but that's what she meant. We spent most of the election not talking about Brexit, but the voters were 
thinking about it because the 2017 election saw a fundamental reshaping of the character of support for the Conservatives. Their vote went up by 15 points amongst Leave voters. It went down by eight points amongst Remain voters. And meanwhile, <coughs> um, on the Labour side, although the figures, the differences weren't so dramatic, the Labour vote was up by about 12 points amongst Remainers and only by about six points amongst Leavers. So a crucial lesson from 2017 is that even if the parties want to talk about something else, they can't necessarily determine what voters will think about. And the truth is that so far it looks as though the, 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 the story of the 2019 election is not dissimilar. The Prime Minister was eager to have a general election because he could not get the withdrawal treaty through. The Liberal Democrats and the SNP eventually precipitated the election because they were concerned that they could not get a second EU referendum through the old parliament. But, yeah, sure, once the political parties have uh, lots of airtime to talk about all their pet projects they've been thinking about for the last two years, they can't really stop themselves from going on talking about their, all their other pet <coughs> projects. But what actually is happening then at the level of voters? Well, two things. The first is that even though in uh, 2017 the vote was quite strongly structured by Brexit, it is now even more clearly structured by Brexit. And when social scientists answer this question about what do voters care about, our preferred way of doing it is not asking voters, though I'm deliberately not talking about that because I'm sure Ben would like to talk about it, but actually just what is the strength of the relationship? What is the strength of the relationship between people's views on a subject and how they're going to vote? That, at the end of the day, is the ultimate litmus test of how, of how important an issue is to people. And the truth is that now 80% of people on the Leave side of the argument are saying they're going to vote for either the Conservative Party or the Brexit Party. Equally, about 80% of people on the Remain side of the argument say they are going to vote for one or other of the uh, numerous parties that are in favour of a second referendum. Now, back in 2017, however, although one can argue the position of the Labour Party was even fuzzier than it is now, um, the only 65% of people have voted for either the Conservatives or then UKIP. And on the Remain side, the, 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 the increase is there, although it's not, it's not so dramatic. So, so far as how people voted in 2016 is concerned on Brexit and what they propose to do now, the relationships are even stronger than they were. The second thing to, to note is uh, the other test that we can apply is, well, is there any evidence that, for example, in talking about health, which indeed Labour voters like to hear being talked about, there is any evidence of the Labour, voter, Labour Party making significant progress in recapturing Leave voters? <coughs> Short answer, no, it's still only 14% of Leave voters who are going to vote Labour, and it isn't clear that this is uh, uh, cutting any mustard. Equally, is there any evidence that the emphasis on the domestic agenda is affecting the views of, cons uh, of the willingness of voters to, vo uh, to vote for the Conservative Party? Answer, no. So there's no evidence that, as it were, cross-Brexit voting has become more prominent in the last two weeks in the wake of the attempt of, voters, of the parties to divert voters onto other issues. On the other hand, what there is clear evidence of is that Brexit is also structuring the changes in party support. Essentially, the Conservative Party have been continuing to squeeze the Brexit Party vote such that they now have even more Leave voters than they had uh, two years ago. And equally, the Labour Party have made a modicum of progress in squeezing the, the Liberal Democrat vote. But it's within the Brexit camp movement. It's not between Brexit camp movement. Now, all of that said, and then I'll shut up, of course, what is true is that at least for those people on the Remain side, though less so now for those on the Leave side, there is more one, than one way of saying, I'm for Brexit or I'm in favour of a second referendum. So in a sense, to, uh, to say, what well, Brexit, is it Brexit or is it about something else, is a false dichotomy. Because, of course, even if you are an ardent Remain voter, and apart from considering tactical considerations, you know, if in Scotland you're in favour of independence, you're going to vote one way, and if you're in favour of something, you're going to vote something else. Um, and equally, if you're in favour of nationalisation, you might be attracted to the Labour Party, whereas if you're not so attracted on it, then you might prefer the Liberal Democrats. So even so, to, that, the way in which domestic issues may undoubtedly play some role is in, is, in the, uh, is in the battle within the Brexit camps and within the, the second referendum camp, but so far at least it's not clear that it's capable of persuading voters to switch between those two camps.
Thank you. Sorry, Charlie, but uh, Charlie, but that, that's, that, I'm hoping, that, I'm hoping that's, the other three are going to yeah. back me up in some way. <laughs> hint, hint. Uh, ben. Okay, so what do voters care about? Well, they vote on they vote on the policy, so Brexit, obviously. Uh, but I'd say the NHS is is in there as well. Um, it's in the in the in the poll that we did last week. They were almost level pegging. But they also vote on their feelings about the parties and their feelings about the leaders. Um, so if you take the issues, the Conservatives, Brexit is the number one issue, and the Conservatives are clearly seen as having the best policies on that, and indeed Boris Johnson is seen as most capable in, de in dealing with the issue of all, of all of the party leaders. So that's the first thing. On the NHS, which is traditional Labour area, um, interestingly, promises of more money under Theresa May and even more money under Boris Johnson um, seem to have neutralised Labour's traditional lead that John's already alluded to on that. Um, so, again, you know, where the domestic issue is, again, the Conservatives are winning on that. So on the parties, which is also part of this, not, not absolutely uh, the key thing, but what's happened in this election, which I found really interesting, is normally Labour is the most liked party. They may not be the most effective party, they may not be the most competent party, but they are the most liked party. And something seems to have happened in our, in what we've seen as the campaigns got underway, is that Labour is now the most disliked party. And that's quite impressive and has taken a lot of hard work by quite a lot of people inside the <laughs> Labour Party. But they seem to have managed to achieve it, which is pretty impressive. Normally, it's the Conservatives that people don't like. They're mean but efficient. You know, they'll look after your money. They'll keep you safe. They're not very nice, but they'll, they'll keep you safe. They describe themselves as a nasty party. And then we've got the leaders. And um, when we started the campaign, we had two sort of bald men effectively arguing over the comb. We've, of, as you will all probably have picked up, you know, Jeremy Corbyn has the worst rating of any leader of the opposition Ipsos Mori has ever measured, which is, again, quite a, took quite a lot of work. There's been quite a lot of competition for that, but he's managed it. Um, but he was, when he came into office, Boris Johnson was also, at, the, at that point, one of the most unpopular new prime ministers we've ever measured. So, again, it's always in politics compared to what? Interestingly, actually, Johnson, during the campaign, despite gaffes, despite all sorts of problems, despite him not necessarily living up to expectations that some people had for him, does seem to have actually improved his rating slightly, and he's now, he's now positive. So on all the issues, quite frankly, at the moment, it is the Conservatives to lose, and they're, they're, it's almost as though they've gone through this with a checklist uh, and sort of ticked off, they, in terms of the issues that the public say they care about, apart from Brexit, the areas of public spending they want to see more money spent on, it is literally like the Conservative Party went NHS, tick, <laughs> education, tick, crime tick, and they've, they've neutralised uh, you know, Labour's traditional advantages in those areas, despite Labour having a lot of policies which are actually quite popular, including nationalising this building. Welcome to your, here you are in, you know, BT, very nice, you know, you're very good. Uh, and, but I think the central challenge in all of this is perceived, comp it's not ideology, it is perceived, what the British actually vote on, uh, in my take on, on this and other elections, is perceived competence. So the British public has not made a massive shift to the left or right, but the public is, is often quite pragmatic. This is Britain, we muddled through, but they judge it on perceived competence. And on that, Boris Johnson, despite all his problems, is far ahead of Mr Corbyn. And, you know, and ultimately, also, they want a party that might give them some hope for the future. And that has to be, mar that has to be married with something about, you know, are they actually competent to deliver it? Because the underlying thing behind Brexit, to me is that in Britain today, 47% of us say our children are going to be worse off than we are. Before the crash, that was 12%. So how do you reassure the British that the future is actually going to be better and not worse? And to me, that, that is at the centre of it. But Mr Corbyn is not, is, not yet, is not yet seen as competent enough to do that, even if free things are popular. The end. <laughs> Thank you very okay. much. Pippa. Well, it feels very strange sitting here and talking about domestic policy amongst Brexit because I spent much of the last year writing and talking about nothing but the EU and our relationship with it. And so when the election was called, despite the fact we were already absolutely knackered, which is normally how you end up at the end of an election campaign, not at the start, we all were also quite relieved that we'd had the opportunity to talk about some other things for a change. Now, clearly, Brexit is the primary issue of the election campaign and it's quite evident um, from 
what both John and Ben have, the numbers they've both given us, um, that that will continue to be the case. But it's not the only story of the election campaign. And um, as Ben alluded to, the Conservatives made a concerted effort very early on to park their tanks on Labour's lawn when it came to domestic policy. And within days of getting into number 10, Boris Johnson was talking about his core issues of the NHS, of crime, of immigration, just very sort of restricted to those in addition to Brexit. And they have consistently, over the summer, um, attempted to talk as much about domestic <coughs> policy as they have about Brexit. Now, that was obviously with an election coming up in mind and with the idea of, of doing those tick boxes and neutralising Labour's advantage. Um, but also, I think, because Boris Johnson needed to show that he was competent and that was, I mean, I'm sure um, the panel can tell us more about how he used to be seen, but certainly having worked closely with him and covered him closely for a very long time, um, it was always the first question that people asked about him. So they needed to, sh to prove to the public that he was serious and competent and, and talking about domestic policy, which he had more control over as opposed to Brexit, which was ultimately um, to some extent out of his control seemed to be a good way of doing that. Now, um, the Tory team writing the manifesto, which is of course led by Munira Mirza, the policy um, unit director who was with Boris at City Hall, um, had a very simple mantra, which was not to repeat the mistakes of 2017. So they're attempting basically to do everything different, including appearing in head-to-head -head debates with the leader of the opposition, which um, they'll be rushing back to Westminster for after to watch on the telly. Um, so that was a simple, so it meant a simple manifesto, and um, it also meant trying not just to not to uh, alienate southern voters as he tries to woo the pro-Brexit Midlands and North. Um, I kind of feel that the election campaign hasn't really got going yet. I think this is going to be a key week. We've got the debates tonight and on Friday. We've got a manifesto launch from Labour, Lib Dems is tomorrow, and then the Tories will follow. And I think when we get to that point, it'll be really interesting to see whether then the polling shift it shifts, because Labour certainly is seeing this as a key moment where they could begin to close that gap. Don't forget that last time, Jeremy Corbyn's Labour was further behind at this point, and then they closed the gap. Not enough to win a majority, but that's not actually, I think, I'm sure we'll talk about more of this later, ultimately their ambition. The bars for winning are very different from the two parties. Boris Johnson needs to get a majority in order to deliver his Brexit plan. Jeremy Corbyn just needs to be the big, big enough party in order to be able to form some sort of unofficial deal, or at least to get, with the support of the SNP, to deliver a minority government. So they've got very different ambitions at the end of it all. I've got loads of stuff I could talk about in domestic policy, but I'm sure lots of it will come up in the questioning. So I'll, I'll wait till then. Brilliant. Thank you. Madeline. Sure. So I don't know about you, but I'm finding this election to be a mass of contradictions. On the one hand, we're told that you know, it's the most climactic general election in decades. It's a choice between Brexit or no Brexit, between <laughs> capitalism and socialism, between Boris Johnson and Jeremy Corbyn, so kind of night and day. Uh, but at the same time, the action of the last few weeks and months has been incredibly boring compared to what came before it. Or maybe it was just that the mad psychodrama of Westminster prior to the general election was just so lunatic that anything seems normal <laughs> in, in comparison. Um, but I think sometimes uh, we journalists are part of the problem in a way because we, we, we obsess about what are often quite minor eruptions in Westminster. Um, and that obsessive interest is not always shared by the rest of the country. So, for example, I would cite the coverage of the Tories, the launch of their campaign, which was, by any estimates, a complete disaster. It followed, you know, awful gaff after awful gaff, gaff resignations galore, etc. And there were so many pundits on the telly saying, you know, this is a disaster. Have they managed to doom themselves already? But then actually the polling from the days that followed suggested that very little of it had actually cut through. Um, and voters often zone out, and who can blame them, until the very end of the campaign, which is why digital campaigns often tend to sink the majority of their money in the final days. Um, what has been truly important over the last few weeks? Um, I would say that the Brexit Party's decision not to run in Tory held seats is probably the most significant development of the campaign so far. It's pretty worrying news for the Lib Dems who are hoping to regain a number of seats in the South West that are held, currently held by the Tories. It allows the Tories to become, to run a more attacking and less defensive campaign than they would otherwise have done. And crucially, I think, it's an admission that Boris Johnson's deal is not, in fact, Brexit in name only. So a great way of clustering the Leave support uh, around a single party. And that message will resound even in seats where the Brexit party is still running. Um, since the election was called, both the Tories and Labour have gained ground. 
at the expense not just of the Brexit party, but also of the Lib Dems, who are having a pretty terrible time of it, actually. Uh, it wasn't long ago that they were actually beating Labour in some national polls, uh, and now they seem to have slipped back into a distant third. Now, that, that's partly the perils of being a smaller party, where you have less limelight, which explains their decision to take legal action for not being included in tonight's leadership debate. Uh, but it's also that jo Joe Swinson isn't especially popular. And as I think Ben and John have both alluded to, individual leader favourability ratings are extremely important. Key planks of Corbynomics are extremely popular with the general public. But actually, Corbyn's own ratings are so dismal that that's enough of an electoral turn-off. Um, however, in a slightly counterintuitive way, I think that by attempting to sideline Joe Swinson in the debates, which is what the Conservatives have done, I actually think that they might be playing into Labour's hands a little bit by making it come across as if it is, in fact, a two-horse race between Labour and Conservative, which means that some people who cannot stand uh, Jeremy Corbyn and much of Labour's policy platform, but nevertheless hate Brexit, may decide that it's the best thing to kind of hold their nose and, and vote for Jeremy Corbyn anyway. So I actually think the Tories could stand to gain quite well by bringing Joe Swinson back into the fold a little bit. Um, what matters <laughs> apart from Brexit? Well, we've heard about the NHS, unsurprisingly. Um, now, this would normally be Labour's bread and butter issue. But actually, I don't think their attack lines have been landing particularly well. Uh, the talk of the Tories selling off the NHS in a trade deal with Trump and so on. Uh, it's partly because for all the bluster about Singapore on Thames, there's actually very little, vanishingly little, in the Tory manifesto that you could describe as Thatcherite or buccaneering free markets. Uh, since the policy, some of their policies announced so far includes you know, big fiscal loosening, infrastructure splurges, uh, reversing corporation tax cuts and promising one of the highest minimum wages in the developed world. And I think, as Ben pointed out, that has really blunted <coughs> some of the traditional attack lines from Labour. Mm. Uh, but there are also big risks for the Tories of enter either entering into a bidding war with Labour that you can't possibly win, or simply by conceding ideological turf on, and giving, giving ground and potentially shifting the Overton window sort of back uh, to the left. Um, Looking forward, I think there are two very important demographics to look out for in the coming weeks. Uh, firstly, the third and the very forgotten third of 2017 uh, Conservative voters who voted for Remain. Um, will the fear of Corbyn keep them away from the Lib Dems? Uh, and then there's the... We, t we hear a lot about the youth quake, but actually the crucial demographic that shifted away from the Conservatives back in 2017 was sort of 40 to 50-year-olds, Generation Xs. Now, the policies that main parties offer on issues that really matter to Gen X, things like childcare, but actually a rogue policy announcement on social care could, could resound with that group quite heavily because many of them are juggling the twin demands of looking after children and looking after elderly relatives. So I think everyone has to be quite careful about what they do on social care. Um, but essentially, Labour's strongest attack line is that the Tories have been in charge for nine years and they have failed to produce policies that have have notably worked for this de demographic that feel particularly stressed. But when, when, as I say, they should be going big on things like childcare and social care, instead they're doing things like announcing a review into the leg legacy of colonialism in Britain, which is not, I'm not convinced that's what the squeeze middle are really looking for. Um, but of course, there's, there's a, still a lot to play for. And as Pippa pointed out, this election isn't so much about whether Labour can win or whether they will win. It's simply a case of can Boris Johnson get a majority? And as we know from 2017, that Labour is still a formidable campaigning machine. And the wrong announcement on something like social care, uh, not that the Tories, I think, would be stupid enough to do it, but, you know, as I mentioned, the disastrous campaign launch suggests that uh, Jeremy Corbyn is by no means the only uh, gaff-prone individual on the campaign trail. Thank you very much. Um, OK, there's loads in there. Uh, I'm going to start, if I can, um, by asking a few questions uh, just to kind of uh, get us off the ground. I, I thought it would be useful to open with a sense of where and who. So um, I was hoping that both uh, Sir John and Ben, you could pick up a bit on the where. So we're told that, you know, Conservatives will probably lose the Scot a lot of Scottish seats, you know, we're told they need to pick up seats in the north, you know, we're told the Lib Dems will probably pick up some around London, etc. You know, where 
for everyone sitting in here, should we be focusing on if we want to understand what the outcome is likely to be? Are the locations or geographies or even types of constituencies that we should be uh, thinking about in particular uh, when we want to see if any of these kind of shifts are occurring? And then I'd like to get onto the bit of the several people have touched on this, but the kind of who. Um, Madeline, you talked about uh, particular demographics. Um, you know, women are a big group here that uh, are potentially a problem for the Conservatives if uh, we are to believe some of what's coming out around their views of Boris. Um, but also, we have been told there's been a big influx in registrations of young voters. Is that going to play out in any way? Or actually, are they already in areas that isn't going to, you know, aren't marginals or isn't going to shift things? So, so kind of... Where should we be looking for and who should we be looking at? I wonder, Sir John, if I could start with you. OK, well, as to where, I'll, could just, I'll confine myself to that for now. <laughs> there are essentially three battlegrounds, uh, two of which the Tories are on the defensive and one of which they're on the offensive. Um, so the two defensive battlegrounds are one Scotland, where virtually everything is marginal and where, in theory, if the Tories could actually advance further, uh, there are rich pickings to be had. Um, but equally conversely, any slipping back by indeed either the Conservatives or the Labour Party will play quite handily into the SNP's hands. The Labour Party is in deep trouble north of the border and could well lose all but one seat. The Conservatives on the last poll were still in deep trouble, but we do have to bear in mind that the Conservative position in the opinion polls in the <coughs> UK-wide has improved since then. And if you look at the innards of um, the published British polls um, since the last published Scottish poll, there is, shall we say, reason to believe that the Tory position in Scotland is now somewhat stronger and that therefore maybe as a result maybe they might hang on to a rather more of the 13 seats they're defending than the uh, three that seemed likely a while ago. But still, they're lacked on defence because the SNP look as though they're at least up marginally on where they were in 2017. And is that a U Scottish? Uh, is that a UK Union question that's leading to? No, I mean I, I, I think 2017 was widely misinterpreted. Um, if you think about it, the idea that the reason why the SNP lost ground in Scotland in 2017 is because people who had voted yes defected from the SNP because they didn't fancy having a referendum quite so early, was clearly, if you just think about it, it's nonsense. Logic. What happened in, what happened, it, it, there's been a crucial change in the character of the both Yes support and SNP support. If you go back to 2015, the SNP were equally popular amongst Eurosceptics as in Europhiles. After the 2017 uh, EU referendum, this begins to, to fall away. And the uh, SNP lost ground much more heavily in 2017 amongst those who voted Leave than those who voted Remain. And equally, by the way, all of the increase in Conservative support between the 2016 Scottish election and the 2017 UK election occurred amongst Leave voters. It was nothing to do with Indy Ruff and nothing certainly to do with Ruth Davidson's views, which of course were not in favour of Brexit. The Conservative Party north of the border profited in exactly the same way as it did south of the border from the restructuring of the Conservative vote. And although there are fewer Leave voters in Scotland, they, they, they corralled them. Um, and, they, and indeed, you've got, you, you could now find for the first time a few people who voted yes, SNP, Leave, Conservative, particularly in the northeast of Scotland. Um, so, and now, I mean, um, indeed, I heard one person only last night claim that the SNP had lots of Leave voters. No, they don't. About one in six of the Leave of the SNP vote now is leave. It's almost wholly a Remain vote. Um, they, they, they scoop up the Remain vote north of the border. They've got a minority of the leave vote. So basically, it, yes, sure. The, at the end of the day, the, I mean, what you have to understand north of the border is that Brexit and the constitutional question are intertwined. Back in 2014, deeply ironic, we spent, again, this is how the, 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 what you hear in the campaign and what's going on amongst voters are not always the same thing. Another classic example. In 2014, the politicians spent hours arguing about whether or not an independent Scotland would or would not remain a continuing member of the European Union. They could have all waste saved their breath because there was no relationship at all between whether or not you were a Eurosceptic or a Europhile and whether you voted yes or no. But after 2016, that relationship has kicked in. So these are no longer separate, separate issues. And the rise in support for independence in Scotland, and it is very clearly there in the polls, has occurred essentially amongst Remain voters. 
Finally, eventually, Brexit has indeed begun to erode to some degree support for the Union. So these things are now intertwined. The second crucial battleground, which Madeleine has already mentioned, is the, is the Liberal Democrat Conservative battleground. So where the Conser Liberal Democrats are hoping to gain ground from the Conservatives. These are very heterogeneous seats um, um, so far as uh, Brexit is concerned. So some, like Richmond Park and St Albans, very pro-leave kind of we'll be staggered if the Liberal Democrats don't pick them up. Um, but others like uh, North Devon, North Cornwall, St Ives, very strongly pro-leave areas, traditional Liberal Democrat areas. And the question there is whether or not they can make their classic um, stance of we're the folk that stand up to those folk 250 miles away in London who don't, who don't care to up and send me about the South West, which is the same sentiment that underlies the leave right there, whether they can capture that, because that's always been uh, central to their purchase. But I, you know, I suspect, I mean, the only point I disagree with Madeleine is I suspect that maybe the withdrawal of the Brexit candidates is irrelevant because they're not going to pick up these seats anyway. But equally, what we have to remember, however, is that you know, there may well be other things elsewhere that they're going to pick up uh, uh, instead. So that's battleground number two, very heterogeneous. Battleground number three is indeed, and therefore Boris has to... Uh, compensate for whatever losses he might suffer in Scotland and to the Democrats by gaining seats from Labour and then some more to get past the 326 mark. And those seats are disproportionately located in the north of England and the Midlands. Uh, Two-thirds of the most marginal Labour seats are in the north of England and Midlands. They are also disproportionately leave. 35 out of 50 of them voted to leave. Um, but the, uh, but then, you have to, uh, then you have to understand, however that um, the Tories don't necessarily have to do anything terribly good. Because there's this enormous myth out there, which is spread by Nigel Farage <laughs> and then repeated by lots of journalists, which is that people in these places... And of course, Labour voters in these places won't vote Conservative. It is inconceivable. Well, ask yourself, why is it the case that places like Bishop Auckland and Workington and Ashfield, which have never voted for a Conservative MP in a general election, are marginal? Mm because the Tories did well in these seats in 2017. They didn't win them, but in th these seats are now marginal because in the most leave part of Britain, again, it's the reshaping of the Conservative vote I referred to earlier, in the most leave parts of Britain, there was a swing to the net swing from Labour to Conservative, even though the country as a whole, the net swing was very clearly uh, to Labour. And these seats, as a result, became more marginal. And in truth, all the Tories probably have to do in these seats is to hang on to what they've got already. We know that 60% of the Labour vote in these seats are remain. It's not a predominantly vote, despite the character of the constituency. And as some of them wander off to the Liberal Democrats, hey, presto, the Tories will win. Now, doubtless, the spin from central office, if that happens, is that there's this great political re uh, re revolution in the character of the Conservative vote that is all uh, Boris Johnson's, uh, uh, to Boris Johnson's Boris credit. <laughs> Actually, it will be the legacy of Theresa May <laughs> and the fact that the, that the Liberal Democrats uh, helped the Tories to go over the line. Brilliant, thank you. Um, ben, are there particular issues that um, either the parties would want to focus on in some of those locations? Well, it's still, I don't know. I mean, you've still got Brexit and public services. I mean, I was just going to build on what John was saying, that last, the last election was interesting, well, was, was record-breaking in the fact that the Conservatives did best ever among working class voters, mm -hmm. which is some of the part because of Brexit, as John's just alluded to. And of course, the Labour Party, the, the Labour Party did best ever with middle class people. Yeah. Um, and so in, in, in terms of these groups, I think there is there is something about how the Conser what the Conservative Party, you know, the Conservative Party in London is, you know, it looks looks pretty difficult because this audience, young professionals generally feeling squeezed. Uh, are, and who don't remember 1983 as a bad thing and think that the IRA, who aren't they in government anyway in Northern Ireland, and <laughs> didn't Blair just, you know, privatise everything and then invade Iraq? Um, uh, so suddenly a lot of the things that Jeremy Corbyn has to say are quite attractive. Um, so I think, hence, hence <coughs> places like Canterbury. So I, I think that, that's, that's an interesting group. The, uh, this, this issue about older working class voters 
And we do need to be to avoid the you know the, the big argument in, in social science around the ecological fallacy, the idea that you know these working at these leave seats, Labour voters in these leave voting constituencies are all leave voters, which I think has now been put to bed firmly. But the thing that I'm particularly interested in is is this tribal thing about the Conservatives in some of these seats that you just whatever you whatever you think about Brexit you just still find it really hard. It doesn't change anything that John's just said, but you find it really hard to vote Conservative. Because I just see that. Yeah, but, but, one, yeah. but one in ten of those people yeah. who voted Labour in 2017 yeah. are saying they're going to vote Conservative. Sure. Uh, there, are, there are now more people switching from Labour to Conservative than there are Labour to Brexit parties. I'd still be interested to see how it actually plays out. Yeah, yeah, sure. This is the point. Labour at 29, they've up from 24. They, they, you know, where do they go into? We can have a, That's where we'll have the debate about how far do Labour move into the 30s. Yeah, but in, the, in the but the share. increase in Labour support is yeah. entirely amongst Remain voters. Sure. There, there, there hasn't been any marked decline in the leakage of Labour votes to the Tories in the last three or four weeks. Yeah, but they're I'm, still just losing them. Yeah, I'm just interested to see what it, how it finally ends up. I think is the, you know, yeah, it's the, sure. it's this, that's my my sort of stick. So but, 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 but the yeah. point is, Ben, they, yeah. the Tories don't have no, necessarily to win a single more traditional sure. Labour voter. Yeah. Just hang on, what you've got, and let, let the Lib Dems do the, the Lib Dems do the work. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah, okay. The Lib Dems will do the work. You heard it here first. Yeah. Well, as Pippa, you pointed out, uh, we're still very early on in the campaign anyway. So who knows what's going to happen uh, further on. C can I ask you the question about women voting? Uh, because I've spoken to various people in the last few days who have been door knocking and one of the strong messages comes back is that, you know, I'd quite prefer the Conservative platform, but I really can't stand Boris Johnson from the women. Is that something you think is going to be important? So I think it's important to say, first of all, that when people are talking about foreign conservative or Labour platforms, neither of them are actually, even though we know a lot, yeah. neither of them actually published their manifestos yeah. yet. So there's a lot yeah. still to come. Yeah. For example, we're expecting Boris Johnson to make an announcement, big announcement about childcare. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and um, they'll be very targeted. Uh, John's sniggering away next to me. Um, but there will be... The parties are aware of their feelings, their respective feelings, and inevitably there will be a policy promise to voters from that demographic, be it women or older voters, or I think Madeline mentioned the 40 to 50s that yeah. are sort of squeezed by the childcare and the social care. But you know, there's also about what's not going to be in manifestos. So Labour, uh, we're expecting <coughs> the Tories to have something on childcare. We're not expecting anything on social care. Yes, they realised that it was a, which is incredible because Absolutely. it is probably one of the two or three biggest sort of you it's know up there in the policy the list, issues yeah, that people are worried about and want to be yeah, addressed. Yeah. More uh, but the Tories, the, the Tories yeah. are determined not to repeat what they did last time, so there won't be an offer in social care. Labour will have an offer in social care. I expect it to be something very similar to the offer in social care in Scotland currently. Yeah. SNP offer. Um, so free personal care for the elderly at home, and they pay for degrees of. Um, Residential yeah, actually, support. Actually, actually, the Labour um, Party have announced quite a few things for England that Scotland already has. Free dental checks, yes, for example, exactly, as well. Yes, exactly. Because yeah. yeah. and, and you know, tried and tested, they, they go down well. So, um, so I think there is still a lot to come on the policy proposal. But the specific question about Boris Johnson and whether or not he's attractive to women voters. Um, Again, I'm choosing my words very badly, aren't I? <laughs> um, um, I think tonight and the debates are going to be crucial in this yeah. because Boris Johnson's best, best outcome of these debates, in much the same way that the Tories' best outcome in some of the marginal seats is just to stay yeah. flat, his best outcome is actually to be quite boring, not to do anything that's going to yeah. be particularly controversial, to grab headlines. What, voters, women, what lots of women voters don't like about him is if he appears dismissive. And Jeremy Corbyn will be very conscious that where he's strong in these debates is talking about the real human stories behind the uh, behind austerity and the cuts and you know hospital waiting lists and you know uh, schools closing early on a Friday and all these different issues which are sort of the the result of ten years of of austerity and he will humanise them and if Boris Johnson appears in any way dismissive of those as his bent is often to sort of you know try and be defensive and if that comes across as dismissive that's bad news for him um, equally. Will anybody actually ask the question how many children he has? Does that matter to, to women voters more? The fact that he clearly has had lots of girlfriends. We've got Jennifer Curie rumbling on in, in the background as well, to, you know, all over our TV screens. Does this really matter? I mean, I would say probably it's priced in. The Tories certainly feel that it's priced in. 
everybody knows what Boris's life in his personal is like in his personal life. He doesn't ever claim to be anything other than that. What I do wonder, though, is if there's ever a sort of a shift from how they view his personal life to how he view his principles. Because mm -hmm. where he's a very astute politician is that he chases, he, he recognises ahead of many more politicians um, the direction of political trends, and he gets ahead of the game. And there was a perfect example the other day when I was chatting to one of his team about climate change, and he was trying to persuade me that Boris was passionate about tackling the climate crisis and recognised what the massive issue this was going to be for the country. And this was how something he deeply cared about. It, he deeply cared about. And I said, well, why did he deeply care about it? Does he deeply care about it? Because I covered him at City Hall for 10 years and he didn't really care about it then. Um, it certainly wasn't a priority. And the response came back because he sees, other, basically he sees the public cares about it. Now that doesn't strike me as somebody that's making a decision based on principle. And whatever you say about Jeremy Corbyn, and he may be very conflicted and have lots of problems in terms of leadership, but I think most people think that he does actually speak from the heart. Does that impact more with women voters? I don't know. But I do wonder, sort of, you know, anecdotally, looking, you know, talking to women friends and women family, that Boris Johnson needs to be very careful not to fall into either of those traps when it comes to, to the debates and public performances, because I think that will actually worsen his reputation rather than yeah. solidify it. And Madeline, could you pick up this point? Well, I suppose two points. Um, uh, two separate demographics. So uh, one is young people, and yeah. you know uh, we have seen apparently a big increase in registrations, at least to vote, uh, which is obviously an indication of an intent to do so. Will they actually do so? Um, and do you think it will make any difference? And you know, are the different things that young people are looking for from um, the parties? Um, also, this point about working class, um, and there was a poll. Uh, which I don't think was Ipsos, but I'm sure you have better oh, ones, versions of it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, which which put, um, uh, working cl put conservatives yeah. 20 points ahead amongst, uh, above Labour. I think amongst, that was Comrades. Uh, yeah. I, I was I couldn't Comrades for the I couldn't, Telegraph. Yeah. I couldn't, couldn't, wow. couldn't possibly comment. Wow. Uh, but, wow. um, but, you know, that, I mean, that is a massive gap yeah. uh, building on where, to Sir John's point, the, the t Theresa May left the polling. Where do you see those two demographics going? So the, I think the, the, the working class vote is fascinating. I mean, it's, it seems quite extraordinary that the Labour Party now attracts more middle class people and the Tories more working class. That just intuitively seems ridiculous. Um, I think that it will be very important in the, next, in the coming weeks um, what Labour is able to propose on freedom of movement. That's an area where I think many working class voters feel that their concerns have been dismissed and, and haven't been listened to. Uh, and so far, Labour has been doing this extraordinary kind of, uh, well, let's say constructive ambiguity. They've been suggesting that they would renegotiate their deal with the European Union um, and then you know, have a referendum on it. But they've also been suggesting that within that, they might even be able to renegotiate the free movement uh, part of the, their EU membership which is a ridiculous proposition. You know, the, David Cameron went over with a much le more modest list of demands <coughs> and they were mostly not met by the EU when he attempted to renegotiate. Uh, but perhaps it's, it's in the Labour's interest to at least have something that they can propose when people talk about freedom of movement rather than simply putting their hands up and saying, we'd like to continue freedom of movement much as it is. Um, and what was the first demographic that you Young mentioned? Young people. Young people. So every year we're told that people are registering in their droves, that there's going to be a youth quake. Uh, it's never really happened before. Even the youth quake of so-called so youth quake of 2017 seems to have been massively overhyped uh, at the time. I think the polling afterwards showed that it was, it was hugely overestimated. Um, but the, the, if you watch m Momentum videos, many of them are uh, aiming towards getting young, sort of almost daring young people to register and then go and vote. So they'll have these videos of some evil banker saying, we don't want you to vote. Um, or something like this, and then there'll be some rich Tory wife in the shires who says, the last thing we want is for you guys to vote, you better not vote. It's very effective, like very good propaganda from momentum, I would say. Um, but I'm not, I'm not convinced that, that that is the solution. People always put their hope uh, in people who've never voted before and young people, and very rarely do those two demographics deliver the goods in the event. I mean, just one point on registration. The data on applications for registration are useless because most of the people who fill in the form online are already on the electoral register. Because the problem is that you, although you can fill in the application online, you cannot check whether you are on the register online. And there is a particular issue at the moment 
is because there will be a new register on the 1st of December. So even if you go down to the local town hall and ask to look at the local register, see if you're on, you still can't necessarily check to ensure that you're actually on the register and the new register comes into after the end of the online period. But that every election now, uh, 2015, 2017, loads and loads, I think it's about one and a half million uh, mm -hmm. apply to be on the register and most of them are already on. Uh, and you basically cannot infer anything about motivation from these, from these data, and certainly nothing about how many <coughs> people are going to get added onto the register. And there's not a lot of sign in the polling, to be honest, of a massive surge in you know, likely voters from non-voters or t typical non-voters. And it, you know, typically our view is that non-voters are non-voters. I mean, and nobody <laughs> finds a clever way of true, true. turning them into... If, the magic of turning them into voters, which immediately gives Labour... It does give Labour... If, you know, if you had compulsory voting, yeah, uh, Labour would do better. But yeah. Uh, yeah. No, they haven't cracked it yet. And given no. how disorganised the Labour Party is, given that they were looking... hadn't even found a pollster by the end of August, uh, one fears that they may not crack it this time. OK. Uh, I have many, many other questions I could ask, but I'm conscious that I'm sure you all do as well. Um, uh, please pop your hand up if you do have a question. I'll take three at a time. But just in a kind of one-word answer before I do that from the panel, sh is it in the interests of the Conservative Party to have a social care policy, or are they, in fact, better electorally uh, ignoring what is probably the most burning public policy issue that we face? Yes or no, Ben? God. Oh, Yes. It depends so, yes, what it is, doesn't it? Better ignoring it, it. But it depends what the policy is. I mean, it, they, they, it is an issue. I think the, the problem with... It's a bit like social, social care and housing are two issues where it's really, really confusing about who's responsible and how the levers work, the levers of power and accountability work. And so people don't understand it. You know, they need to be seen to... It's nice to be seen to do something about it, but ultimately you have to be seen to be doing something that is believed to be actually practical yeah. that could actually happen. And so it's not a, it's not, if you do something really stupid that makes, that makes people think you're going to put on a death tax on them or something like that, which Dementia might actually, tax. actually most people think a death tax is pretty good. Most experts think some sort of death tax is a good idea, but we won't even go there. Obviously. Um, but no, it's not, it's, it it, I mean, yes, it's probably sensible to have a policy. Does it, is it a game changer? No, unless it's really, really stupid. Fine. Madeline? Yeah. Madeline? I yeah. think they, need to, they should keep their campaign as simple as possible, keep it to very specific lines, get Brexit done, stick to talking about crime and a bit of extra, some extra money for public services, quite frankly, because there's always the danger that they, they promise... Avoid anything they promise, they promise something on social care and then Labour can legitimately come back and say, how can we trust the party that gave us the death tax? The dementia tax. Whoever thought of dementia tax is a genius because that followed them around like a bad smell at the last general election. It was it. I really, I thought it was a journalist had coined the term or something. But no, I think they, they they need to keep their messaging simple. I mean, I understand that Minira Mirza is having a much much smaller manifesto than the great yeah. tome that Nick Timothy composed back in 2017, and that seems quite sensible. Well, I simply observe that it would be somewhat curious for a party whose support is overwhelming amongst <laughs> older people to offer lots more money being spent on childcare and yeah. saying nothing about social yeah. care for older people. It might suddenly strike some people as a little peculiar. There we go. Well, and I, I kind of wish that we lived, it, well, we had a political system or indeed an electoral system, and I know this is completely unrealistic, where parties could agree to, that they would, for example, have a Royal Commission on social care on and pensions. say, yeah. and they did on pensions, exactly. And, the, and it could be genuine cross-party agreement. You're never going to get that during an election, but, but why but couldn't you have it I afterwards? Mean, I, I mean, we had Andrew Dillnot. The legislation's yeah. on the statute yeah. book. Yeah. You just need to implement it. It's not complicated. But the politicians <laughs> won't do it because of what happened this in 2017. This may be why you're not a politician, John. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, the, pro yeah. the problem in 2017 yeah. is the Tories decided yeah. to depart from Dillnot yeah. and to make up something on the yeah. back of a fag packet. Yeah. Yeah. But actually, <laughs> the legislation yeah. is there. It just needs implementing. I, I should point out at this point, the reform has a very sensible... Uh, <laughs> uh, suggestion, a uh, set of proposals for social care, and I very much urge all of the parties to right, consider okay. those. Uh, okay, so opening up for questions, I'd say I'll take three at a time, because um, I'm sure lots of people will have them, um, and please do sort of wave at me if I haven't noticed, but I've got one here, if I take the three down the middle, so starting at the bottom here, uh, say three at a time, and then I'll come to the panel. 
If you could introduce yourself, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, uh, Tom Rowley from The Economist. Uh, that was great fun. Thank you very much. Um, uh, the nearest that two very polite people get to a bus stop um, was your discussion about northern voters and, and whether uh, Labour people would, would actually, in fact, switch to, to the Tories. Um, two little questions on that. One, do you agree with, with Madeleine's theory about the Lib Dems and that actually the Tories should sort of big them up as much as possible and, and, and get them on the election uh, debates? Um, uh, uh, and secondly, um, if you were going to put your neck on the line, um, which of these Labour seats in the North do you actually think are going to turn Tory? And do you think that's because Labour people are going to stay at home or vote Lib Dem? Or do you think that some more of them are going to, to turn to the Tories? Thank you so much. Immediately behind you. <coughs> uh, hi, Mark McVitie, uh, LABC Group. Um, the first question was just about polling. We're directed at... Uh, Can I ask everyone to keep two, just one question? Otherwise, oh, we're going to get to a lot. No, sorry. Okay, you. Yeah, uh, you pick your favourite. Well, just to point out, the, the, today uh, there was a Cantor poll, which I think had the Conservatives going up at an eight points in the lead. And there was now just just been released a YouGov one, which has them going down to 12 points, lead cuts 12 points. So the polls are kind of showing us different things. But generally speaking... What they're showing us is, at the moment, a massive Tory lead. So I was just thinking, I was sitting listening to John McDonnell all day laying out this broad perspectives on what he wants to do with the economy. And I was thinking, this is all very interesting, but there's absolutely no chance in the world that Labour are going to form a majority government. So does that actually have an effect on what, whilst we're listening to all the, the parties saying these things in an election, the only party which is actually going to be in a position to form a majority government is the, Tor the Conservatives. And so, so what, what the effect question? does that what, have on voters? What, what is the effect does that have on what voters think? And the fact that are they aware that Labour can't form a government? Yep. Do, are voters actually attuned to this, or yep. is it just people inside the Great. bubble? Okay, thank you. And straight, sorry, straight behind you. Okay. Uh, Charlie Garnett from Shaw Trust. Uh, my question is about universal credit. By the end of 2023, there'll be seven million families on universal credit. That's quite a significant proportion of the UK population. Uh, why has this not been a bigger election issue so far? Uh, and do you think it's something that uh, Labour should be uh, speaking about more? Great, thank you. Uh, perhaps um, I can come to you for the question about which constituencies yeah. uh, in the North might go. Uh, and is the value in Madeleine's point about uh, the Tories making being a bit warmer towards the Liberal Democrats? Yeah, yeah I, mean, uh, I mean, on the first point, sure. I mean, Boris Johnson's strategy rests crucially on the fact that he's got 60% of the Leave vote and Labour Party's only got just over 40% of the Remain vote. There are actually slightly more people at the moment saying they'll vote for parties in favour of a second referendum than parties saying they're in favour of Brexit. But the split on the Remain stroke pro second referendum side is absolutely crucial. And yes, he, the, I mean, the, the one thing about this election that Boris Johnson cannot control is what happens to the Remain vote. And the thing that, above all, he doesn't want to happen is for it to coalesce behind the Labour mm. Party. And it's happened a bit so far, but so far no more than the rate <coughs> at which the Tories have managed to coalesce at the Leave vote. But sure. Uh, it, I mean, it's always been true in this election, right? Boris Johnson needs Joe Swinson to do well in exactly the same way as Jeremy Corbyn needed Nigel Farage to do well. All right? Farage... I mean, Corbyn's wishes look as though they're not going to be fulfilled, and the, but the question that still is left is, will Johnson's wish be fulfilled? Politics makes strange bedfellows, and certainly it's in, uh, when it comes to how this electoral system uh, creates different situations. You said to me which northern seats will go... Um, well, um, the answer to that is simple. If um, the polls are at all roughly correct, then most of them are going to go. Period. Well, there we go. Uh, Ben, can I ask you this point about, um, and I think actually, Sir John, you were making this point forcefully uh, uh, in an interview recently that um, Labour are not going to get a majority. So, Correct. so you know, it, it, well, it looks it looks pretty unlikely. I mean, let's you know, say, stranger yes, things have should, happened. We but we should it, never say no. no the, so, we, I think um, the question is: Are the voters all sitting here in exciting things like this? And the answer is no, they bloody aren't. Um, we do think, I mean, when in, in polls, so you have to be, you know, uh, you get around perhaps 50% or so of people say they pay attention to polls, um, and that's the people who take part in polls. I, and I, but, I, but on the other hand, I think there is, a, for a lot of voters, there is still, although it's dying out um, because it's generationally 
driven. There is a, you know, there are a lot of people who treat their, there are still lots of voters, millions and millions of voters, who treat their, their, their party like a football team, and they will vote for them come what may. And uh, so even if they know they're not going to win, they'll still vote for them, or, 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 or none of, the, you know, or not the Tories in some cases. So I don't think that people aren't necessarily mass, you know, tactical voting is, is there. It's not, it's, not, it's not anywhere near as, as large as you might think it is. Uh, quite frankly, and so I don't think that the fact that the, the Labour aren't, you know, clearly can't form a majority, and therefore everybody should go and vote for somebody else, isn't going to happen. You know, as we know, you know, you could make anybody in this room the leader of any of the two main part of either of the two main parties, and I can guarantee that it will get 28, at least 28 percent of the vote. That's a cast iron rule, and it doesn't appear to be. I thought it was. I thought Corbyn was going to break it last time. I turned out to be completely wrong, and uh, there's no sign of it being broken this time. Um. Perhaps if I can come to you on the universal credit question. So, uh, I mean, it is a huge issue. I think we would all certainly in this room be very familiar with the challenges uh, uh, of both delivery and some of the dire impacts uh, that some aspects of the policy are having. Um, and yet, I mean, Corbyn talked a bit about, you know, kind of not pausing the rollout and then sort of fudged, maybe scrapping universal credit yeah. and tweaking around the edges. But, it, but it's not really, you know, welfare in general is not really an issue in this. No, well, campaign. on universal credit in particular, um, the plan is to, well, I would say scrap it, but to keep the, basically the same, to keep the basic structure and to make changes around the end of it. I mean, we all know that uh, from both Gordon Brown's tax credits proposals and now Universal government's, uh, this government's universal credit proposals, how um, any reform of the welfare system is incredibly complicated and incredibly expensive and not very sexy, frankly. And that's why politicians don't like talking about it at elections many of the for those three. Don't vote. And crucially, many of the recipients don't vote. So <coughs> while you may, uh, many uh, voters might be very concerned about the issue, those who are actually directly impacted by it in terms of how how or whether they're getting their payments are not necessarily going to make it to the ballot box in the first place. So, um, I mean, I think we will hear more from, from Labour on their welfare policy. Um, I think that they recognise that there are other issues that, uh, when it comes to boosting their share of the vote, um, they be, they're better focusing on, and I think that's what will end up happening. And Madeline, you, you talked about in your opening remarks kind of this sort of the, the bubble effect, and I think everybody's touched on it. Yeah. Um, how far will, I mean, welfare obviously isn't being talked about at all, but how far are some of the other public policy issues actually going to cut through? Or do you think it's almost a sort of pointless exercise having manifestos because ordinary people, you know, people like us, political geeks, read them cover to cover and decide what we think and et cetera, uh, and yeah. hope some other people might be interested in our commentary on it. But will anyone read what's in the manifestos? Is that going to go anywhere? I think certain policies could definitely tri trickle down to, to, to the general public and really cut through, particularly if they are seen to, I think if they are seen to uphold um, people's pre-existing cliches about any of the major parties. So the big gaffes of 2017, we've talked about social care. Another one was fox hunting. They never thought it would go that rogue. Mm -hmm. I think Theresa May thought it would be a good way to thank some of her door knockers in the countryside who were involved with groups like the Countryside Alliance. So she wanted to give something back to them, thank, thanking them for all the door knocking they did at the last few elections. But of course, that plays into people's pre-existing stereotypes of evil Tories, and that really followed them around horribly. Um, Oh, no, no, definitely. In fact, you might even see definitely a not. not to revoke it. Uh, no, it's definitely not. And they're going, they're, they are trying to, uh, I think that, I'm not sure how effective it will be, but they have quite sensibly, I think, tried to reach out to uh, some sort of centrist Tory remainers by going big on issues like the environment and animal welfare. And not least because I think Boris Johnson and, of course, his, Carrie Simmons care deeply about, about those issues. Um, but the... It comes to quite a stark choice for, for Tory Remainers in these seats. On the one hand, you've got, you've got to accept Brexit, but then you're also likely to get a, quite a, a nice, fluffy version of the Conservative Party. You're not going to get some kind of rampant Mad Max dy dystopia that is the, the stuff of Corbynist nightmare. Um, but, but at the same time, you're also dealing with a cons a Cor uh, the, the Labour Party that has actually shifted notably leftwards even in the last couple of years. You know, Many good Labour MPs have now left in protest at the anti-Semitism within the party that's been ignored. Um, and you also have really quite radical policies. I mean, some, of, some Corbyn, Corbynomics is very popular, yeah. some, some nationalisations. Yeah, but, very but, 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 um, uh, 
the, the proposals around private school, for example, that's not popular with the general public. People it's are not against. going to be there. It's not going to be in the manifesto. No. It's something that they that the activists no. they, they um, at the party it. conference in the same way with the migration policy, which made all the headlines and lots of papers splashed on. They're going to abolish private schools. It's the end of Eton. Um, it's going to be open borders forevermore. Just because party activists vote for something does not necessarily mean it makes it into manifesto. And in both those but cases, didn't Angela Rayner basically won't. give a speech saying that she endorsed the policy? No, Angela Rayner went around and told everybody that it wasn't going to happen. <laughs> but but on that, is it? I mean, again, sort of that nuance between its party activists versus its actually party policy is probably not something that most people out there are going to understand. So, you know, do, yeah, does that, na to, to your point about playing to stereotypes, mm -hmm. you know, do, do you think um, those sorts of votes in the party faithful um, are unhelpful for... Well, it keeps the activists happy, and ultimately, especially in a winter election, you've got to get people out on the streets yeah. knocking on doors, don't you? But it will be, uh, you know, I expect that, that most party activists, irrespective of which side of the political fence they sit on, will recognise that compromises have to be made to make parties here more electoral and be prepared to put up with those compromises. I'm not so sure about that, actually. Just uh, just recent weeks, it's turned out that many activists from Navarra Media, which is a kind of pretty far left, the, 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 what's her, I can't remember her name, Ash but the girl who's Sarkar. Ash Sarkar, she said, she, I'm literally a communist. Turns out that these people are involved in WhatsApp groups with kind of Labour quite top dogs giving them attack lines to run with in the news. So essentially, some of the distinction between these activists and the people who are making decisions in the Labour Party has kind of blurred in a way. Yeah, but Martin, these things aren't always straightforward. The Scottish Government has already moved to end the ability of private schools to profit from not paying uh, rates um, as a charity. The world has not collapsed. Support for the SNP has not collapsed. Let's be clear. And, that, and, that's, ex and, that, that, is, is and that's exactly more. and that's exactly the kind of thing that Labour Party will have in mind for south of the border. Oh, and by the way, freedom of movement is popular. It's immigration that's unpopular, and the polling. I mean, actually, I, I can find you polling by done by comrades for you that shows that freedom of movement is popular. It's, uh, so the crucial issue here is framing, right? Um, if you, if, uh, at the moment, there's more than one poll quite mm. recently that has asked people, you know, are you for or against freedom of movement, which means that people from the European Union can come here and Britain can go elsewhere, and we're getting quite large majorities in favour. Then you go on and ask people, and then you go and ask people, should immigration go up or go down? And they say it should go down. And then you give them a whole list of various professions as to whether or not it should, the way we should have more or less of them. Bankers. And people say bankers. more. Oh, we don't Every, want bankers. No, that's only true. bankers. But, but, no virtually, bankers. but virtually yeah. everything yes, else, true. including chefs, yeah, yeah. cleaners, yeah. we want more. Yeah. So actually, Social public care. attitudes towards yeah. immigration are now much more nuanced than yeah. you might imagine. I'm sure we're not suggesting that the public and our voters are contradictory in any way. So, <laughs> of course uh, they are. So, um, yeah, and it, and it, you know, it was worth mentioning that there are plenty of people in the Conservative Party, including a former Secretary of State for Education, who has floated removing the charitable status for private schools as well. So uh, anyway, but would, uh, would you just quickly say that very Scot quickly, because I do want to give people Scotland is a to... notably now more left wing place yeah. than no the rest of the no UK. Okay, <laughs> we're, we're not having. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, we're not having. I'm. I'm. I'm going to bring some order here, uh, so that so that we can uh, have some more questions. I can see we've got. Uh, in the middle there, uh, front row here, and there's another one, I think, behind. So the middle, down one, yeah. Um, and then here. Thank you. So uh, my name is Sean Walsh from Cancer Research UK. Um, not a question related to cancer. But uh, trust is in the news a lot at the moment, yeah. for various reasons. And various panellists have talked about bidding war, uh, parties offering to plant more trees than one or another, more money into the NHS. And I guess relating to the question, is trust important to voters anymore? Yeah. Great, thank you. And Lisa here. Uh, Lisa Haley Joan, British Private Equity. Pippa, you picked up the much was made about the winter election and how this is going to be affected by turnout. You know, we've already had floods this early winter, could get some snow. Is the issue around the turnout really going to be relevant? And then uh, if there is bad weather, will then the losing party use that as an excuse? Well, I think we know the answer to that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, Neil at the back there. Hi, Neil Amos from PA Consulting. 
Um, listening to conversations about working class voters and middle class voters almost takes me back to my politics classes in the 80s. And I'm, I'm wondering whether actually things like ethnicity and the, the ethnicity vote, if there is such a thing, is going to play any part at all in this election rather than the sort of homogenous working class vote that often gets discussed. Great, thank you. Um, Pippa, can I start with you on the question about trust and mm. sort of does it matter what politicians say now because everybody takes it with a pinch of salt? Yeah, and I think over time we've increasingly taken it with the ever bigger pinch of salt. I mean, buckets we had of salt now. buckets of salt. <laughs> so in the Brexit referendum, um, you had vote, for, you had um, uh, uh, Project Fear on one hand, and then you had you know promises about 350 million quid extra for the NHS on buses on the other hand, and I don't think either side emerged from that particularly well when it came to uh, improving uh, politicians' reputations for, for telling the truth. And, um, and we saw it in 2017 again, and, and here we are the third time, or well not just third time, here we are again, beginning an election campaign where big numbers are being chucked around. Um, a good example was the Tories' 1.2 tr trillion calculation about how much um, Labour was going to cost the economy. Now, I mean, aside from the fact that actually Labour wasn't that bothered about that because they're quite happy to say, yes, we're going to, if we get a majority, we're going to, you know, be a radical government that's going to spend lots and lots more and it's all going to be good things and the economy is going to grow. Um, the, uh, the figures were very quickly, um, uh, I'm trying to be polite about it, they were very quickly analysed and um, sort of there's recognition across the board that they probably weren't as accurate or as reflective of Labour's plans um, as they might be. Um, you know, I think personally that Labour's argument against the Tories for making these figures up, um, their, their false mathematics, their false accounting, would be uh, they'd be on stronger territory if they weren't also doing things like saying, well, you know, uh, if Boris Johnson takes over and there's a trade deal with the US, we're going to have massive US corporations coming in and our drugs bill is going to be 500 billion quid more than it might otherwise be. And actually, I challenged John McDonnell about that the other day. I was saying to the panel earlier, and uh, when he was when he was grumbling about um, about how, to, how it frustrates him as a bureaucrat that the, the that Labour that the Tories could come up with these these big numbers um, and not be sort of held to account for them, uh, and his his response was well, okay, well you know five hundred billion, well you know even if it was half that, it would make a difference. <laughs> so um, so I think both sides do it. I don't think it's good for politics. I think it's the or politi uh, the reputation of politics, but I think it is a reality of the world we live in. Let's not get into the you know, post truth and Donald Trump, but you know that obviously is a spectre hanging over all of this. That, yeah. <laughs> um, and the size of these numbers, anyway. I mean, when you're talking about billions, how far does the public understand that, and how far does it? You know, it, are they actually hearing? You know, twenty thousand police officers. I understand. You know, it's going to be a hundred billion for a. Green New Deal or whatever it is, yeah. am I going to get that? I think, I think that the, there, was, there was a real issue with throwing these massive numbers around that it's just such an incalculable amount of money um, that it just doesn't really land with people. And generally, I, I'm, not, I'm not endorsing the, the cooking of the books, but I think if they, if they wanted to get more punch with these numbers, they would be better off trying to cost things down to it'll cost each household X amount or X amount per head rather than just, you Relatable know. Numbers. Yes, exactly, yeah. totally. Yeah. Um, Ben, uh, the winter election. Well, it's probably overblown. I remember loads of people vote by post and we'll be starting fairly soon, which is something that we um, get. So I think most of the evidence, I, we did a piece of work with the meteorological office actually once looking at turnout and weather and couldn't really find anything definitive. So we haven't had an election recently in mid-December in, in living memory pretty much, but uh, I don't think it's, I think it's a bit of a red herring quite frankly. It will undoubtedly be used by the leading, le losing side as the problem. I just want to come back on trust. We've, there's a free report that you can download on the source Mori website called Trust the Truth, which we produced because we really wanted to look at the prevailing narrative that trust is in terminal decline, nobody trusts anybody anymore, you know, nobody, nobody trusts politicians. And the bottom line is that we trust politicians to tell the truth about as much as we did in 1983. It's never, it wasn't very good in 1983, it's not very good today. Um, trust in virtually every other profession, including journalists, has actually gone up 
Uh, trust in scientists and professors is at an all-time high, which is why John is uh, doing well. <laughs> it's why I had to go and pay my colleague Bobby Duffy to become a visiting professor at King's College to get more credibility. But, but the bottom line is it's overblown. And even, even anxiety about your data on the internet and trust in your date, where your personal data is going and worries about that are identical in a, in a pan-European study to before the internet was invented. So again, it's one of these things where we human beings, we look for patterns we see that we see populism everywhere. We know that trust is low. And we they say, oh yes, it's something to do with a loss of trust. So it's 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 overblown. And ethnicity, yes, we haven't talked about it. It does matter, and it's, it's still you know largely pro labour. But and that's what I wanted uh, to ask Sir John you about the kind of homogenous working class. And actually, if you cut the demographics slightly differently, and you did go for say ethnicity, would that make a difference? Well, sure. I mean, the point is that uh, irrespective of their uh, occupational position, uh, those who belong to the UK's ethnic minorities are more likely to vote Labour. That's more true of the Afro-Caribbean population than the population it is the South Asian population, but that's just long been a fact of, of, of UK life. Um, but let's just come back, just get, get underneath this notion of class. I mean, the reason why the relationship between people's occupational position and who they vote for is now weaker. I'm sorry, it comes back to Brexit. Because, of course, on Brexit, Brexit is divided demographically by a age, which is also now, by the way, the biggest source of division in terms of how people vote, but b by education. Yes. Not surprising because immigration is something that younger people with labour market skills acquired through education do, and it's something that happens to older people who have little in the way of labour market uh, skills. They have very, very different real interests with respect uh, to immigration patterns. But the point is that those who are graduates are overwhelmingly in favour of Remain. Those who have less in the way of educational qualifications are overwhelmingly well in favour of Leave. Of course, those who have less in the way of educational qualifications are more likely to be what we regard as working class occupations. But the crucial dynamic here is not occupational position. It's, it, it, it's position are, are on education. And it's that what's overturning the traditional relationship. I, but again, it's Brexit what's doing it. Brexit is undermining the traditional links. It means the Labour Party... Uh, in, as Ben's already alluded to, but, uh, the, the Labour Party was the most, by far and away, the most popular party amongst university graduates for the first time. Um, but equally, the class relationship has weakened. But it, it, you know, it's the result of Brexit. On the winter election, um, well, let me just uh, say, first of all, the highest turnout in a post-war British election was in an election held on the 23rd of February, 1950. The other uh, winter election we had was on the 28th of February 1974. And um, boy, that was winter because the electricity was off for hours, the heat was off for hours, and we were only allowed to work a three-day week. And 79% of us turned out to vote. Now, of course, what was true about both those elections is that the election took place <coughs> immediately after the introduction of a new electoral register which automatically it will uh, in, increase the level of official turnout because there are fewer people on the register who are no longer with us. Um, uh, and now, however, we introduce a new register on the 1st of December. So one of the reasons why other things being equal, the turnout will rise um, on the 12th of December is that, again, there will be fewer people on the register who are no longer with us. It's a fresh register, and that helps to, to, to increase the turnout. Thank you. I think we've probably got time for one more question. Uh, if I can ask you to keep it brief, the, the lady just in the red there. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Bia. Um, I'm not really here with anyone. Well, I'm, ju I'm just a person, but... Um... <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> I, I, I make coffee. That's my profession. Um, but um, I am here as an EU citizen. I think that's why a big part of why I came. And I don't have the right to vote in this country, unfortunately. Um, but I wanted to ask if, as like experts in this kind of area, if you think there's a chance of the idea of migrants being able to vote in the UK to become popular with British people, or will voting in this country always be tied to being British? Great. Thank you. Uh, if I can ask some very quick answers uh, from a panel. Well, director. the first thing to realise, of course, is that voting in this country is not confined to British citizens. It's available to Irish citizens and citizens of the Commonwealth, 
That, of course, is a legacy of empire, indeed, a legacy of another occasion when we gave lots of people freedom of movement, i.e. those who were Commonwealth citizens. Um, actually, in Scotland, it is now the policy of the, UK, of the Scottish government that residents uh, should be able to vote irrespective of citizenship, and I think there is now legislation going through that will implement that for Scottish elections and for Scottish local elections. I haven't had time to catch up on the new uh, bill that's going through the Welsh Assembly on local elections, but and question mark, maybe there's something going on. So the answer is the issue is being raised, and as ever, Westminster seems to be somewhat behind the curve. Would anyone else like to so add you don't think it will? I, well, I think it's unlikely. We couldn't even get um, PR, a sort of modified yeah. form of PR, through, an, through a referendum recently. So I think that this, this is unlikely. Any, any differing views? I think it's quite possible that EU migrants who've, and there are very strong arguments for EU migrants who've, for example, obtained some kind of settled status and mean to make Britain their home uh, to, to have the right to vote. But I think that it would actually be quite bad for um, trust, actually, in politics if it was seen to come in. Uh, preempting one one vote in particular, if it was seemed to be the brainchild of a party that had, let's say, it was, you know, a coalition of the Lib Dems and Labour who pa transparently want to have a second referendum. If it was seen to be cooking up the second referendum, then I think that would be sure. wrong and unfair. But I think it should be it should be a discussion that we think of for, for future elections, but perhaps not the next one. Yeah. And in this particularly fractious time in politics. I just agree with that. I think it can't be it can't be uh, bound by one issue. It would have to come at a time um, where it wasn't seen in that way, um, and I can't see it happening anytime soon. But uh, not least because I think the party that is most likely to consider it would be the Labour Party, and I can't see them getting a majority. Uh, well, and on on that note, I did say I would come back and ask uh, for predictions. Uh, obviously, not to hold anyone to them, uh, even in the next few days, as who knows what's going to happen. But thirty-seat Tory majority—it's just a guess. Okay. I've always been awful at predictions. I'm terrible at Mystic Meg. I, I actually had predicted Corbyn would be Labour leader, but that was my last success. Okay. It's been a disaster ever since. So I'm going to go. So that health warning. That health <laughs> warning. Go and place a bet. I can't see Labour. I can't see how Labour does well in this situation. I can't see how they improve on their situation. And with the combination of the Lib Dems, I think it is some kind of. Slim Tory majority, perhaps Slim Tory 20 majority. seats, 30 seats. Conservatives are two to one on at the moment to get an overall majority. And you think that's right? <laughs> no, 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 I'm saying <laughs> that is my view. My okay, view, fine. My view is okay. that the Tories are currently you two to one on, okay. which, which right. if you want to translate, is 66% chance of a Tory majority. Okay. There we go. So very, very precise, <laughs> as I would expect. Thank you. So I think if the election were tomorrow, I'd say a small Tory majority. The one word of warning would be that Anything can happen in these volatile political times. We've got a few weeks to go. Jeremy Corbyn's a strong campaigner. There are all sorts of events that could get in the way. So you could yet see, it's not entirely implausible, you could yet see the Labour, Labour as the biggest party, but I don't think they'll get a majority. No. <laughs> <laughs> We're definitely like ending this. it on that note. <laughs> Before our hell blakes loose. Um, thank you so much uh, to the panellists. I mean, it's been a, a riveting uh, and fun and, you know, insightful, uh, I think, discussion. Um, and you have given up a good part of your evening. And I know I'm sure several people are going on now to, to do leader debate stuff. So very, very grateful that you've made the time to, to come and address this reform audience. Um, can I again thank Simon and BT for hosting us here because it is a fantastic venue and, you know, it makes such a difference to charitable think tanks to, to have partners uh, that can help us out. And of course, thank you to everyone here. Uh, who hopefully you've had a great evening. Hopefully you'll take away a little bit of insight, at least if only about the electoral role, which I had no idea about. Uh, so uh, that's, that's just the sort of geeky knowledge which I love to be able to go away with. So um, I hope you have all enjoyed it. Thank you so much. And can I just do a final thank you? I, I know I'm, I am sort of uh, making the whole award ceremony thing slightly true here. Uh, but can I also thank the reform team because this has been put on at incredibly short notice and they have done an outstanding job uh, to make sure that we had a brilliant event here this evening. So if we can just show our thanks to everyone. Thank Ladies, there are a few drinks upstairs if you care to partake for about 30 minutes. It's all free, so go and enjoy. It's the first festivity of Christmas.